What's up, future physios? Welcome to another episode of the Physio School Podcast. My name is Cash Mahdi, and with me, my co-host today, you know him as the Canadian Physio School student, aka your mom's favorite physio, Anthony <laughs> Pinto da Costa. How's it going, Anthony? I'm doing well, man. That's uh, quite the introduction here. Uh, but yeah. yeah, day's going well. I'm uh, excited to hop on this podcast and uh, interview uh old classmate of mine for sure. Yeah, this one is a great episode. So when we were thinking of starting a podcast, I couldn't think of a better person than our next guest here. She's actually one of the most interesting people I know. So the Dosaki guys has nothing on her. So all the way from Nova Scotia, I want to welcome our very first guest, Logan Wood. Logan, welcome to the show. How's Hi. it going? Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. How's everything? How's Nova Scotia? It's great. Um, it's very much East Coast weather. So we're talking like lots of rain, lots of cold, but it feels like home to me. So I'm happy to be here. Nice. And this is a new move, right? You just moved to Nova Scotia? Yeah, this is actually, I've just started my third week. I kind of left Ontario on a Friday, uh, drove through, started work in Nova Scotia on the Monday. And like I said, it's my, this is the start of my third week here today. Awesome. Awesome. And where are you working now? So I'm at, um, it's called Valley Regional Hospital and Soldiers Memorial Hospital. So I'm at two different hospitals in the, Annap in the beautiful Annapolis Valley, which is Nova Scotia's wine country. And it's right on the ocean, on the Bay of Fundy. Um, and I'm working uh, primarily in outpatient physio here, which is exciting. Ontario, where I previously worked, had outpatient departments, but it's, a lot of them have kind of shut down over the years, but here it's still alive and well. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great area to work. Awesome. That sounds like a change from what I know where you worked before. So that's awesome. Yes, Little absolutely. variety there. Absolutely. So in this episode, we want to interview Logan because Logan had quite a untraditional path to physio school and we're a really going to get into that. Road. Long <laughs> winding road, but a really interesting one nonetheless. So we want to start off asking more so about your life maybe before physio school, because I know a little bit about your background. We've spoken before quite a bit, and I know that you've had quite a crazy life pre-physio school. So why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about what you were doing career-wise before you applied to physio school or before physio was even in your mind or in sight. Fair. Fair. Okay. So I would say, uh, so, I, so I started physio school when I was 33. So I had, and you know, there's a lot of time between 18 and 33. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Um, so I was in and out of school a lot. Um, I traveled, um, I worked, I guess, as an outdoor instructor. So I would say, uh, yeah, I left home at like 16 and moved to India for two years. Um, and then came back and was just, my world had been blown open. So I wasn't, uh, coping very well in our Canadian society. I was just seeing like problems with everything. So I thought I would be a, an artist and change the world through my art. So I did a two year diploma in visual arts, um, worked as a starving artist for a few years, and then uh, did a social, most of a social cultural studies degree. So I studied like folklore and sociology and like would travel to rural Newfoundland and interview, you know, elders in the community about how things used to be and stories from their childhood. Um, and then I dropped out of that program and decided to do recreation. Um, so I did a combination of like rec therapy, but I also fell in love with outdoor recreation. So I just was, you know, camping and canoeing and hiking and kayaking and just rock climbing doing all the outdoor stuff, um, and then ended up moving to Alberta for a couple of years to work as a whitewater wilderness canoe guide and like a river guide. Um, and then after all, I had <laughs> all of that fun, <laughs> I was, you know, I guess 31 or 32 by that point. And I was like, mm, I've had a blast. I'm broke. I don't know what the future holds. <laughs> maybe I should make some choices <laughs> and like stick with something for a couple of years, see what happens. Man, it sounds like you had nine lives before physio school. <laughs> it sounds like yeah. what nine, nine lives, other people's lives would be. Yeah. So yeah, I would say nine lives, zero regrets. Um, but at the same time, like very happy to be 
in a different place now, in a stable career, feeling really passionate about what I do. Um, and physio has so much flexibility that I really feel like I could have another nine lives, you know, but within the scope of physiotherapy as a career. So it's pretty exciting. Awesome. Can we just backtrack for a second? I've never heard why you ended up going to India and what you were doing there. I was so, going to ask that too. So I was like uh, a bit of a smarty pants in high school. Um, and I also was like very socially engaged, like cared about all the issues, very passionate. Um, and so there's a series of schools around the world called United World Colleges. And there's one in Canada called Lester B. Pearson in BC. Um, and then the rest are like all over, like uh, US, Norway, India, Singapore. Uh, yeah, just anyway, uh, I applied thinking that I was applying to go to Canada and we'd narrowed down to like the last so many candidates. And they said, so we actually have two scholarships this year. Who wants to go to Canada? Who wants to go to India? And I'm pretty sure I was the only like 16 year old with bright pink hair who was like, India. <laughs> and then they sent me. So, and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. We lived in like stone huts. Um, you know, I wake up in the morning and go in the shower and there'd be like lizards and frogs in my shower. Uh, 200 students from all over the world, like 200 hormonal 16 year olds from all over the world with different cultures stuck in this tiny village on top of a hill in the middle of India. Um, chaos was just the reality. It was, uh, it was a amazing life changing experience and definitely altered the trajectory of my life. Um, I probably would have had a lot less adventures, um, in my twenties had I, I would have followed like probably a pretty predictable route of high school, university and onwards. And I probably oh, never like would us. be a physio. Oh, like like <laughs> a shot. That's a shot. I mean, yeah. you guys are cool stuff too. <laughs> awesome. So that's so cool. So you obviously went through, you know, a lot here, right? The big experimentation phase. And, um, I know you said, you know, by the time you were like 31, you were kind of like, okay, maybe I should figure something out here. Did you have kind of that age in your mind that you're going to be like, okay, now I want to try and kind of choose a career or did something kind of click with you? Was there something that kind of sparked your interest to maybe go down that route? I would say I just had some big life changes. So I had been married and I got divorced. Um, so that's pretty life changing. And then I was in Alberta loving life um, and it was sort of occurring to me, like, maybe I couldn't do this forever because, you know, you're hucking. I'm trying to keep up with 20 year olds. We're hucking canoes over our head. We're paddling for 12 to 14 hours a day. It's, you know, I was feeling the aches and pains at the end of the day. Um, and then, yeah, so I was going through like a big relationship breakup and then my dad broke his leg in Newfoundland. And so I was the only one who had the flexibility, like my brother and sister were working and had lives elsewhere. So I had flexibility, I could go home and take care of him. Um, and I saw him go through the process of surgery, physio school, uh, sorry, geez, surgery, <laughs> physiotherapy in the hospital. Um, I was trying to support him at home and it did not, the surgery did not go well and he needed like multiple surgeries and a skin graft and stuff. And it took like a year. Um, so as I was helping him through this, I was also reevaluating my life. Here I am 31 home with my dad, you know, not really financially stable. Didn't even have an undergrad degree at that point. I had dropped out of recreation with like two or three courses to go. Um, and yeah, I just was feeling like a bit old and like my future was very uncertain. And I started to feel like if I didn't make a change now, that this was going to be the rest of my life. So I would say I was feeling pretty hopeless before applying to physio school or getting into physio school. And was God. that experience with your dad the reason why you pursued, pursued PT or was that not on your mind at all at that time? It, it really wasn't, which is funny in retrospect. And when I think about what actually happened, like I... If I had known anything about physio, I would have like made him do his exercises. They told him he was weight bearing as tolerated, but it hurt too much. So he was nervous to put weight on his foot. So he was like using a wheelchair and using his crutches for too long. So 
things that would have like helped promote healing if blood flow and circulation was getting to the area. So there's things that like now I can reflect on and I'm like, oh, we really like I kind of messed up. If I had known then what I know now, maybe his experience would be different. Um, but at the time I was not drawn to physio or really thinking about physio. No. So at what point did that happen? At what point did you start thinking about physiotherapy as a potential career path? This is extremely embarrassing. Um, I started dating a doctor (laughs) and she was like, and I was embarrassed to tell her, I don't even, I actually think I didn't tell her for like, until I got into physio school that I like didn't have my undergrad degree. So, cause I was really ashamed that I dropped out of like so many programs. Um, so I was just like, she was like, you should like, you're smart, like do something, you know, what is your future? And her whole family is kind of like that. They're very supportive and very motivated. And I was looking for, I probably, I don't know if I would have come upon physio school without it, but it was like, you're active, you're smart, you, you know, consider physio. And I was like, oh, isn't that really hard to get into? Like, I don't know if I can get into that. So, that and sense. then I tried. So, so before that, cause I know you're saying you're kind of in and out of school. What was that, you know, final degree that you ended up getting before physio school and when did you complete that? And where did you complete that? <laughs> okay. So literally I completed it after I got into physio school. Oh, wow. Like I graduated okay. a little at, bit about that. Like I graduated that spring, but like I was waiting on all my final marks and stuff. And I had already, I received my acceptance in like May. And I think my final course was done. My final courses were done like over the summer. Um, yeah. So I think I technically graduated like fall 2017 with my undergrad degree and I did do it in recreation. Um, and so like I fulfilled all the requirements, it's a combination of rec therapy and community rec and outdoor rec. And I did it in Newfoundland at Memorial University, which is where I had originally started it. Um, and I started it in 2012, I think, or maybe 2010, um, was that when I started my rec degree and I grad, I would have finished it in 2017. So yeah, 20, 2010 to 2017 for one degree. Wow. So how much of a gap did you have in between when you left your undergrad? Cause you did leave it at some point and then return yeah. back to it. How much of a gap was that from when you left and when you decide to pursue physiotherapy and went back to school? So I left, so I left my first undergrad in 2007 or 2008. And again, okay. I was like three quarters of the way through that one. Um, and then I took a lot of time off. I worked as a snowboard instructor. I worked as like an art instructor. I just kind of did whatever. I worked as a barista. I make a mean latte. Um, <laughs> and then I and then I would have gone back in 2010. And then I stopped in 2014, I think. Maybe 2013. Like it was it was was a couple years. Um, but I, but even then I was, I was not maintaining a full course load for like a full semester load for most of my, for most of my semesters, I was like working part time or I'd take on too much and have to drop courses. Um, I have a attention deficit, which I did not know. And I kind of got help with right before getting into physio school. Um, so that I think is one of the reasons why I was able to sustain the heavy course requirements in physio school. I was really nervous when I got in, like, I felt like this is my last chance. Like if I got kicked out of physio school or if I dropped out of physio school, it would just be devastating. Um, but yeah, I needed, I needed help to kind of manage that case, that course load. And, and I hadn't been able to ever do that. I don't know if I'd ever done a full semester um successfully without dropping a course well but no problems in physio school right like seeing well you're a physio now so well i will say i managed to get really good marks but Mm -hmm. i have never worked harder at anything in my life so it also i think if anything taught me 
how to work hard and how to focus um, and how to push through when it felt very stressful and very difficult. We went through it together at the exact same program. So I can definitely second that for you. Um, another question I had for you. So, you know, you obviously got accepted to Queens. Queens likes those applicants who have a lot of those diverse experiences, if they're physio related or non physio related. Can yeah. you kind of speak to those physio related experiences that you took on uh, leading up to your application, just so that the viewers can get a, or I guess the listeners can get a, a little hold on that? Yeah. So I think in my case, um, it's important to understand that how you present something like is key because I actually didn't have that much experience. So here's the trajectory of, of when, so I decided in like, when was it? Fall 2016. I decided in like, I think September, September, October, like like mid fall 2016, that I was going to apply to physio school. And you all know the deadlines were like, I guess, January 2017 for us to start September 2017. Mm -hmm. So I had a very limited time. So I needed to make sure I got some physio specific volunteering and experience. I wasn't worried about the other stuff because I had so much from like working with kids with disabilities at camps, all the outdoor leadership stuff I did, all the art stuff I did. Like I just had so much in that area, I could kind of ignore that. Um, so I found a physiotherapist in my small town in Newfoundland and basically like, you know, reached out and was very lucky that he was open. And I did most of my shadowing with him and I, he actually ended up employing me um, for a couple months as like a PTA like an untrained PTA, basically. Um, so private practice, very what I would consider like typical orthopedic private practice. He was an F camp. Um, so I really, until I got into physio school, I didn't really know what physiotherapy could be. Um, and then, so I had that as primarily my volunteer experience that I was going like a couple times a week. I wasn't working. I was taking extra courses to upgrade like I needed to take an anatomy and physio and physiology. Um, I took a bunch of online ones. And then, and again, these were courses that I like started in the fall and I was completing through the spring and summer of like my acceptance and then started in the fall. So it was all very quick um, and I'm really lucky it worked out. And then the other thing I did was I made connections through my partner who knew some physios at some hospitals in St. John's um, which is our bigger city in Newfoundland. And so I traveled there and basically begged to shadow people, like whoever would take me. So I had maybe like three days of shadowing in the hospital system. I had no idea, no idea. I saw like an art line pulled on like an ICU transfer. I saw like a guy, like a new um, amputee fall on his residual limb. Like I got a lot of like, whoa, <laughs> in, my, in my couple days of shadowing. But uh, I had no, I had no idea what to expect, actually. So I would say I was very unprepared for the reality of physiotherapy, and I'm really lucky that um, I just love it so much because it could have gone the other way, I guess. Now, uh, we spoke before, and you do have a quite an interesting way in which you were able to increase your GPA for physio schools. Could you so maybe speak on that? Because I thought that was something I've never heard of before. And I think other people would benefit from learning about how you were able to bump up your GPA right sure. before you're applying to physio school. Sure. So I spoke a little bit about um, how I dropped courses and had difficult semesters. So I was very strategic about how I applied and where I applied. Um, so DAL, which is the East Coast Physio School, and is one that specifically has Newfoundland seats. So if you're a Newfoundland resident and you apply to DAL and meet their prereqs, you have a, like a very good chance of getting in. Um, but I did not meet their prereqs. And I think they look at the four years and not just the two years. So I knew right away I could only apply to schools that looked at two years because my first two years of my degree, like my first however many courses, I had like a wide range of marks, right? I'd get a 90 and then I'd get a 60 and then I'd get a 90 and a 60. And it was all based on my interest in the course. I just, I wasn't playing the game right. 
Um, so I had to look at my last, what is it, 20, is it 20 courses or 20 credits? I don't remember how it worked. But anyway, I had to look at them and I saw, okay, my last 20, I had a chance. I had two really low marks. Like we're talking like 30, like something that's going to just bottom out my GPA. Um, in interspersed with like a whole bunch of 90s. So these were, first of all, they were obvious ano anomalies. I think if if they had seen, if the picture had looked like this, I don't think I would have had any luck with what I did. So basically I went to the university that I got these courses from and I, um, and I applied to have them like stricken from my transcript. Um, and it was not an easy process. It was a stressful process. Um, I had to be like upfront with why I had gotten these bad marks and how it was going to hold me back if it stayed on my transcript and how I had like changed or improved and what my plan was going forwards. Um, I think there is a lot of support out there for students who are struggling for whatever reason. I think mature students in a lot of cases fit that bill whether you are working multiple jobs while you're trying to pay for university, whether you've got a kid at home. Like for me, um, you know, I was someone that, like I said, I have attentional difficulties that have obviously affected me across my lifespan so far. Um, and so I had to kind of be upfront with that and say like, this is my circumstance, please consider removing this. Um, they could have said no, but they said yes. So I don't think the strategy will work for everybody. You have to be willing to be pretty vulnerable. Um, and you have to, you know, you just put it on the table and you hope that people are going to be responsive to it. And, and I was lucky. So it's, it's just, an option if you're desperate. And just to be clear, this yeah. wasn't you retaking the course to replace the mark. This was a course that was completely dropped without you having to retake that course, correct? So, so I don't, so where I go to school, um, where I go to school, at, at the university I was at, okay. if you retook the course, it doesn't replace your mark, right? Like typically they don't drop your worst mark just because you retake the course. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's different at other universities. So, so some of the courses I had retaken because it was essential. So I think it was a stats course was one of the ones that I got a really low mark on. Um, so there were a lot of reasons why. And I did go back and take it after, and I had gotten a really good mark the second time. So that was part of my argument was that, look, I have the capability to do this. The fact that I didn't the first time is related to all of these issues. It's not just that the course was too hard and I couldn't do it. And now I'm whining about it, I guess. That was, mm -hmm. that was my defense. Um, but I think the other course I dropped it and I didn't retake it. I think it was like an anatomy and physiology course. Um, and I just ended up taking what I needed to get into physio school from U of T online. And again, did very well in that course. So yeah. And then I would say, oh, sorry, go ahead. Right. And I, I said that, and you mentioned before when we spoke a little while ago that you had done all this intentionally before the application went to Orbis. Cause once it goes to Orbis, then it's done, right? It's on your quote unquote transcript. It's on your transcript. Yeah. So the, you have to get it out at the root, right? The official transcript is where you want the GPA. Now they will, they still do the calculation differently. So I think Memorial's courses were graded as not as hard as a lot of other courses. So I had like a 4.0 at Memorial, but that translated to like a 3.8 something. Um, I think in like when I applied to the Ontario schools. And what was your GPA when you applied to physio school, if you don't mind me asking? It was, so I don't know, Anthony, maybe you can help with that. So I got in, I got, I passed um, the cutoff, the cutoff for MAC and U, and, and U of T and um, Queens, but I did not, I did not pass for Western or else I wasn't meeting their course prereqs because I think my English was too old. So I don't know what it was our year. It was like, it was 3.8 something. Yeah, I think the year, so if you would have met U of T's, I think our year that we applied, 2017, the cutoff was uh, 3.82 at U of T. For uh, us at Queens, I think it was like a 3.7. So you yeah. would have blown that so one. So I think I was a 3.83. 
or 3.84. I was like in that realm because U of T, I wasn't waitlisted for. I automatically got the cap thing or whatever. But from for Mac, I was initially waitlisted for the um, whatever they do, their crazy OSCE thing. Um, I was initially waitlisted and then I did get the invite to go. Gotcha. Awesome. That's cool. So, yeah. so, uh, one thing that I, I really wanted to, you know, help you or get you to dive into was, you know, as a, as a mature student applying, what was that whole application process like, like finding resources, speaking with other people? Cause you know, when we were talking, uh, you know, off the recording here, we we're kind of mentioning how there wasn't a lot of resources out there at the time. So can you kind of uh, walk us through that for uh, your experience? I mean, I would say I literally flew by the seat of my pants. Um, again, my partner got into medical school. So definitely I got her to look over my like essays. Um, I was lucky to have a few really good references from university. So, so profs that like really got me that I had a great connection with that wrote me incredible reference letters. Again, the, the physiotherapist that I shadowed, like he wrote me a reference letter that like, I, I think I still have it somewhere. It, I like read it and I was like, this is going to get me into physio school. Like it didn't, I didn't even feel like it was reflective of who I was. It just made me sound like a God. So I was anyway, so I was really, so luck. I think I can't understate the fact that luck unfortunately plays a part unless you've done all that good planning and maybe you've, you know, done one of your courses and gotten that inside scoop. Um, Cause there are lots of really good candidates who don't get in every year. And so I think, I don't know how I would have handled not getting in. I probably would have really took it to, taken it to heart and thought that it said something about me and my capabilities. But I think what I've learned after going to physio school and seeing all of my peers is that there are just so many good candidates and they can't take everybody every year. So if you can get that leg up. Um, and again, like I said, I, I, I optimized the resources that I had. I was, I was frankly feeling quite desperate. So I had like, I had like no shame. I was willing to like call whoever I needed to call, do whatever I needed to do to be as strategic as possible um, to make it happen. So did you, um, question for it, did you ever go on those like pre-med 101 forums? Yes. Yes. And you and I, right? We connected on one. I think. Yes. There was a few and maybe <laughs> Mo. Yes. So I went on them and, and, and was trying to find out like cutoffs. And then I think after I was accepted, I wrote a few people who weren't accepted um, and like shared my um, letter, my experiences, GPA, all that. Yeah, probably. yeah, because yeah. I'm so mad. And that's like my personality. <laughs> I get so mad at the system. I was like, why isn't this information out here? Why aren't people being honest? Yeah. You know, if, if the reality is that like many people could be a good physio with the right training and experience, like just be upfront about what it takes and help people, you know, succeed. So there's a lot of that out there for, for medical school. So I, I, to be honest, I think it's cool that you guys are doing this. I think, uh, I think there's definitely a gap there mm -hmm. um, and we need more physios always. So. Need them out there. Yeah. Anthony has been waiting to ask that question for a really long time. <laughs> he sent me a link a while ago with, a. Uh, with this forum and he's like i think this is logan i swear i think yeah. this is her it is me it is me, it is me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. i was using that a lot i forgot about that so that was like a very helpful forum to me i think because i was using it like before i got in and then when everyone was waiting and freaking out <laughs> and when we were trying to decide there was like a letter that was sent out from queens a the letter that was sent out about the scholarship and it was like we were like if you got the scholarship letter does that definitely mean that you're in? Or if you didn't get it, does it mean you're not in? And I think what we decided was if you got the letter, you definitely were going to get an offer. But if you didn't get the letter, it didn't mean you weren't getting an offer. It just meant you're probably your score wasn't high enough to be considered for the scholarship. I don't know. It was something like no, that. No, I'm pretty sure everyone who gets that letter gets in. That no, was that my year too. My year too. Everyone yeah. got the letter. Oh, was it? Okay. In. But yeah, there were some this. people that didn't get the letter and still got in. Maybe that they got was, waitlisted. That could be it. I'm maybe. not sure. But I remember 
I was working at a clinic and I got this letter and uh, another kin that was working there didn't get the letter. In fact, the other two kins there didn't get the letter. One of them had a higher GPA than me and didn't get the letter. And we had a new hire at the clinic, a new PT who graduated from Queens. And when he heard I got the letter, he's like, you definitely got in. Only people okay. who get in get that letter. So okay. I don't know. Well, I guess we'll see over time. We'll hear I, more I, about this. I will say, though, there was uh, a, couple ye- a couple years after us, there were some people on that forum. And this is why that forum kind of drives me nuts sometimes because there's so many things on there. Yeah. People who did get that letter, but did yeah. not get it. Did so not get in. Okay. There, yeah. There, the, it's it's not always history repeats itself. I know we're kind of trailing sense. off. Yeah. They're being sneaky. Queens. They're just sending out yeah. fake letters now. Sending it just to make sure that. I know. I bet there's like, there's like a in. Queen's prof who was like a lurker and is like, let's mess with these guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can't let them think they know what's going on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's... uh. That's why, yeah, those forums, like you never know who's on there. You never know the information that you're getting out there. But yeah, yeah I know. I just remember uh, like seeing like an account with LOG in it. I think it was like Winter yeah, Log. Winter Log, probably. <laughs> yeah. That's my Instagram. Yeah. And, I, and then I made the connection after. I was like, wait, I think, I think this is one of my classmates. And I think we talked about it or something. But yeah, yeah. you were on there all the time. So I know you were kind of like scraping for that information. And um, I honestly, was like purely focused and it was, I think it was like, some of it was maybe before I applied, but I spent a lot of time there after I applied, just like freaking out. <laughs> just like, you know, there was nothing in my control. The application was in, I had not applied to OT school. I was full of regret. Um, and I just, yeah, I, that was like one of my coping mechanisms, I think going on there and just trying to like figure things out. Yeah. And anticipate if I had any chance of actually getting in. Yeah, no, it was absolutely insane. I was always anxious on there, but you know, we got through. Um uh another question I had for you here is uh, you know, kind of knowing what you know now about uh getting through uh applications as a mature student, getting through physio school. Do you have any just general open advice for um, any aspiring physio school candidate out there? And this could be for anyone across the board. I know it's one of those big questions, but I know you got some good insight here. Yeah, sure. Um, I would say a few things. Like I would say trying to like maximize the variety of your experiences. Um, and you can do it in a way that's fun, that doesn't just feel miserable. Um, and then the other thing is like framing your experiences Cause like anybody can be like, oh, I did this, but if you, you, you make stuff, you don't lie. Cause that's not cool. It all has to be, you know, an experience that you had or something you did, but you can frame things in ways that make you sound more interesting or make the experience sound more valuable than it was. Like I was a camp counselor for kids and it sucked. I was basically a babysitter. It was awful. And I wasn't even very good at it, but Framing that in the light of volunteering, it's like, oh, I spent three summers coordinating a camp for kids with a variety of needs because these kids did have a variety of needs and it included kids with disabilities. And, you know, you you, you just you can make pretty much anything sound like a valuable experience because really life is full of them. So I would say that would be my big piece of advice is not to discount, you know, what you've already done. I definitely managed to piece together an application from things that I did not, you know, again, like I said, I had a little bit of shadowing from a, from a orthopedic clinic and a couple days in acute. Um, and that was, that was enough. You don't, you don't, I don't know. I don't know why they want us to have so much physio experience because nothing prepares you for physio school. And I would say getting your acceptance is the first step. And then you have two years of like probably the hardest work you've ever done. Unless you did like biochem as an undergrad and then you're fine. But <laughs> if, if you did something fun for your undergrad, then expect to just work really hard. Um, and that your classmates are resources, um, you know, not competition. They like, I would say some of our best bonding experiences as a class. And I sort of felt like an outsider just because I was older and had a bit of a different life um, than a lot of my classmates. 
Um, but the bonding that happened when we went through hard times and went through hard exams and OSCEs was like, and we were just down in the lab, just like sweating it out, trying to like, you know, get this practice in before the clock. Um, I will think fondly on that as much as it was fairly torturous during the process, there was like a, a sense of like a dark humor to it or something where we were all just in it together. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that was really advice. I think no. it's great. I think everybody should do it. That part where you said you felt a bit of an, as an outsider being a little bit older than your classmates, that's something I can definitely relate to. So what was your experience like as a mature physio student in physio school? Well, I would say part of it was my own fault and I have regrets about my own perspective coming into it. I definitely came in with a bit of a chip on my shoulder. Um, I was really nervous. I, I was really worried I wasn't going to fit in. Um, I was not I, like I did rec therapy, so I didn't have like a strong kin background like a lot of people did. Um, I'd been out of school for a long time. I felt like I just felt old. You know, I had a different lifestyle. Like my partner and I, we just like to hang out at home. I didn't really go. I maybe went to like two party type things or three over the two years. Um, so I think I, I kind of negatively isolated myself in some ways and just assumed that people uh, wouldn't want to get to know me or spend time with me because of that. So I kind of like, you know, when you just shoot yourself in the foot, I kind of did that starting out. So I have some regrets. Um yeah, so that it got better and I got to know people and I started to feel that sense of community. But I think I kind of, I was my own worst enemy, at least initially. Um, it took me like a good year to start to believe that I was going to make it through the program. So I was pretty stressed for the for at least the first year. And then in the second year, we were thinking about the PCE and I was terrified because the year ahead of us hadn't done so well. So I was just like terrified that I was going to fail the written in the clinical and like fail it three times and never be able to practice as a physio. So I was high anxiety. It, it's, it's funny that you guys, uh, you know, talk about it from, from that perspective as being mature students going in, like, you know, some of these people who may be younger than us, who just got out of, uh, you know, undergrad, like the quote unquote traditional route, uh, maybe don't, won't want to get to know us. Um, from like our perspective too, sometimes I feel like it, it goes that way as well. Like one uh, experience that I can always look back on is, you know, our good classmate, Alex Dirksen, right? At the time, I had no idea how old he was, but he told me that he was with his girlfriend for like 10 years at the time. So I was like, okay, this guy's got to be like in his thirties for sure. And he's not, he just started yeah. dating her at a younger age. And yeah. um, I thought like, cause he lived in my building and I was like, well, he's my classmate. Like, this guy's not going to want to hang out with me. You know, like this guy's got all these other things to do. But as you mentioned, as we went throughout the program, you see like everyone's just kind of level playing field and everybody becomes friends at the end of it. It's just all these misconceptions at first that kind of serve as a barrier. Um, but but as, as you kind of go through it, like you mentioned, those those dark times, those times that, you know, you hate it to go through, but you look back and you're like, you know, those, those were good times that kind of bonded us all together and everything kind of comes full circle by the end of the program, but just wanted For to sure. shed some light on that. For and sure. Logan, did you ever feel like it was difficult making friends as a mature student? Like you couldn't relate to a younger student or you didn't have a problem with any of that? Well, I think I like on the surface, I can talk to many people, but I think it's hard for me to make close friendships anyway, just like a like, a, you know, some people put their barriers up. They just don't want to be judged or rejected. And I think I tend more towards that category. So I come across as being like super open, but that's like a, it's true. Like I am open, but underneath it, there's like a, like do not pass. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's like a bit of a personal personality thing. And then adding my age to it, it just makes it uh, even more so. So I, I came away with, from the program with like, I would say three people who are solid friends and then like other people who are acquaintances and I appreciate. And if I bumped into them, I'd be like really happy to see them, you know, pretty well, actually I would say pretty well anybody in my class, if I bumped into them in the street, I'd be 
like excited to see them and we'd like have to get a coffee or a beer or something. So I definitely feel different at the end of the two years, but going into it, I really, uh, I don't know why, I guess just, yeah, just social anxiety or something. And I don't know if it would have been better or worse if, if it was 10 years ago. Like if I was the same age as everybody as well, not as everybody, but the same age as most of our classmates, I I don't know, maybe it would have been worse. (laughs) Now we sort of skimmed over this. You did mention that you got into a couple different physiotherapy schools. So which schools was it that you got in? If you could just refresh my memory. So I I got into Queens and U of T. Um, I don't think so. I only, so I only applied in Ontario um, because after I did all my research, my quick research, I realized that they were my best chances. So I was trying to optimize my chances with the short amount of time I had to apply. And they all had pretty, a lot of them had pretty similar requirements. So I wasn't even looking at the prairie provinces. I wasn't looking at Dal. I had planned if I didn't make it through the first year, like if I didn't make it initially, I would then widen the net. Um, Yeah. So did the cap at U of T, um, got in my acceptance there and then got into Queens and then had to make a decision. So, yeah. And why'd you choose Queens? Um, I was really torn. Uh, I thought I liked the U of T program more. Um, I thought it'd be more like just, I thought it'd be more my vibe, except I'm like not a city girl. Um, and then the icing on the cake is that my, my partner who was my girlfriend of like a year, a year and a half long distance at the time, um, ha- like ended up going to Kingston for her residency. So I knew I had support there and she'd been very helpful with the application process to get into physio school. She'd been through medical school. She knew how to get, put her nose to the grindstone. So, you know, I don't know if I would have, uh, I don't know if I would have survived physio school if I if I hadn't gone to Kingston where she was. I think I maybe in U of T just would have like it would have been too much and I would have run away to the wilderness of Alberta. So. <laughs> cool, cool. So, you know, now you've graduated 2019 Queens University. Yeah. You head right into practice. Yeah. Pandemic hits. All yes. these things have happened throughout the past two years. Bring us through that. I know you've talked about some of your jobs that you have right now, but maybe uh, talk about the ones that you started off with and how that whole process kind of went. So, um, yeah, so it was crazy. So I was really lucky. I think, Anthony, you're in the same category as me. We're we're two from the last cohort to successfully complete the PCE clinical. Um, Man, I'm very grateful that we're we were good to go because I know not everyone was so lucky and it's just been a total dumpster fire since then. Um, so yeah, so we got the results for that in February, but I had started working in, um, November after, right after we did the clinical. So I didn't do my written until the fall. I was originally scheduled and I'd done Cash's written course. I was originally scheduled in July, but it was just too much. I just could not get ahead with because we were still kind of in classes and doing stuff. So did that in the fall, did the clinical, um, worked at Belleville Hospital near Kingston for uh, a month or so. And then uh, my partner and I moved up to Midland to work. And so I got a job at the hospital there part-time. So I was working three days a week at the hospital. And then I was working two days a week in private practice at a sports medicine clinic there. And both were awesome experiences. And it's funny now, two years later, I was really nervous starting work. Um, And now I'm just like so comfortable with like everything. So I was really lucky in the hospital system. One of our classmates, um, Steph Edmonds, actually her mom is a physio there and her mom really took me under her wing. She's like a veteran acute care physio. She's just brilliant. And so she kind of mentored me, um, taught me her ways. And so in a, in an acute care setting, I'm like, just like throw it my way. So I worked emerge, mostly admission avoidance, ICU during the pandemic, during COVID, like our hot ICU, I worked the COVID unit in acute medicine, worked surgery, worked our inpatient rehab units. We had like a faster, like active rehab for like strokes or younger people who we expected would make functional gains more quickly. And then we had a slow stream rehab where 
patients would stay for like three months or more where we expected sort of a slower trajectory. Um, like maybe they were, you know, unable to walk at all or unable to get out of bed at all with like, they would require like two or three people's help. Um, so yeah, so I did that for the last two years. And then the two days a week at sports medicine clinic was awesome because we actually had um, an amazing sports medicine physician um, there who like, you know, if I had a patient where I was like, oh, this might be a complete rotator cuff tear, like, oh, maybe he needs an urgent referral, there's been trauma, then I would say, hey, Dr. Jones, do you have a minute? And she'd say, okay. And she had a point of care ultrasound there and was just, so she was just an incredible resource and I learned so much. So I did that for two days a week. Um, so I really feel like I lucked out because I got to grow my clinical expertise in sort of many different areas of physio. Um, so I don't really feel like I forgot anything from physio school. There's definitely stuff that I sort of tossed out and said like, eh, I'm just not really gonna use that. But um, a lot of it's just more cemented and now I feel like I could kind of work in any area. And I'm in, uh, so I'm an outpatient physio right now um, where I'm seeing like, it's a weird mix because they don't have much inpatient physio. They've got like a big rehab um, center in Halifax and they've got like sort of a slower, cent like maybe a kind of a geriatric rehab or restorative care a couple hours away. But for a lot of the patients that I'm seeing in the hospital, in the outpatient uh, system, they'd be patients that in Midland would be an in inpatient rehab. So they still have like major functional gains, you know, they're post-op or they're post-stroke or they've got a progressive neurological condition. So I don't feel like I'm kind of, I shouldn't say that. I was going to say stuck seeing the boring <laughs> private practice things, but, <laughs> but what I mean is, you know, you, you feel like you're making a difference when um, you can help people with that really functional stuff. It's obviously helpful to, you know, you, you want to help people with their pain as well. I just think that physio's role in that area is sometimes overstated. So for me, I find it jives more well when I can help people, um, you know, get stronger, increase their range of motion, improve their gait. Like, like I like to have those types of goals with people. Cool. I was so, going to ask you which area of practice do you prefer? Do you prefer public or private? And I think you just answered the question. I did. There. Yeah. So, so, and it's not like I haven't um, written off the idea of working in private, but I think it would be like I would be working for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I just have, you know, I have ethical problems with some of the ways that physiotherapy is, is practiced. Um, so I would be like, I, I was lucky in that I jive pretty well with the sports medicine clinic um, that I was at in Midland. I think they're wonderful, you know, very like I stand by what they do. Um, but I otherwise am actually a terrible employee. So people probably don't want to hire me in the private system because I'm going to be discharging patients. I'm going to be telling patients, you know, where they can go buy cheaper braces on Amazon instead of buying our expensive marked up braces, you know, like I'm going to, tell people how to do things in a way that I think is, is ethical. So the, the public system is, is better for me in that way when I'm working for somebody else and when I'm working for myself, um, you know, I don't need to be making $200 an hour. Like, you know, you can, you can make a good, good salary and still be helping people um, in a reasonable way. So I just think the problem with a lot of our, private clinics is you've got somebody on top who's like scoop, scoop, scoop that money. Mm. And then all of us little worker bees underneath who are, uh, you know, billing, billing a lot from our patients and then not getting to keep very much of it. So. Man, I really share that sentiment with you. Uh, yeah. We could talk about this all day. We'd, we'd be here probably for another three be. hours. We did we this would. the other we'd night actually. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did actually. Have it. For like yeah, this is a conversation later. I have so often with so many physios. But yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more there. My idea is like a physio cooperative where we like share mm. the necessary resources, but then physios do their own thing and keep their own money and just pitch in the way that like most physicians practice where, you know, there's not like one top physician who's scooping all the money from all the other physicians. It's like you you know, you, you, you work for yourself, you make your own money and then you just help out with expenses. Hmm. I like awesome. it. Do you got, uh, any last questions here, Cash? 
No last questions. That was an awesome interview. I already knew it was going to be a great interview, <laughs> just knowing your life and everything you did beforehand. Definitely, I think, delivered. I think that definitely delivered. I think a lot of students or prospective physio students will learn a lot from your experience there. You have a lot of insight, a lot of experience that is probably not traditional, but there are other students like you who apply years out from whatever other career they had in the past into physiotherapy school. And I think it's important for them to hear that and be inspired by that because there's not many, but there are some out there who do have a non-traditional path to PT school. So thank you very much, Logan, for joining us. Thank you for everything. That was an awesome interview. Anthony, anything you want to add to that? No, I think honestly, all great. Everybody always focuses on the traditional route. So having, you know, this as a resource out there, like you mentioned, for people who aren't following that same route is going to be absolutely incredible. And just a cool backstory. So many things. (laughs) So interesting. It's hard for me to make up my mind. So, so much to do. So many things to experience. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, if you enjoyed this episode, definitely, definitely subscribe so you don't miss another one. Please, please, please consider leaving us a five-star review so that we can continue to put out the best content for you. And if you need to reach out to us, definitely check us out on all social media platforms, which you can find in our show notes. All right, guys, we'll see you at the next episode.